Hello and welcome to the that week 2021 virtual conference. This is session for symposium 02 entitled e floras, e faunas, and species pages: projects, methods, and tools. And I am your moderator. My name is Paco Pando. My co-moderator is William Ulate, and we are grateful for the tech support from the University of Florida conference team and the conference organizers. A few points for you to keep in mind before starting. This session will be recorded for later viewing. Please speak slowly and clearly for our international attendees. Thank you all for joining us and thank you to all the speakers in this session. Each presenter will present for 10 minutes. There will be three minutes for questions at the end of each presentation and two more minutes for transition between presenters. And there will be more time for further questions at the end of the session. Please ask questions to the speakers using the questions and answers feature of the HUA, and this will be and this will be asked to, of the present, uh, to the presenters by the co-moderator. There are two chats available in HUA. The one available from the Zoom screen is not persistent. The one that is part of the HUA platform will be able to be used and seen by anyone accessing the session on demand. The chat function has remained available for technical questions and for conversation with other attendees. Please use this judiciously as any appropriate use of the chat might result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. Please see our code of conduct document for more information. And with this, we start our presentations. Pierre Bonnet, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation to allow us to present our work. So let me share my screen now. You should now be able to see it. Yes. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone. So my name is uh, Pierre Bonnet. I'm botanist uh, working at CIRAD in Montpellier in south of France. And with my team, we are happy to share with you recent progress obtained in the development of the PlantNet platform, facilitating the development of your own projects on that platform. So the field plant species identification is a difficult task because it requires a lot of expertise regarding the very large number of species that occur in a given area. It is, however, a crucial step for sharing and accessing knowledge aggregates over the past centuries. Plant identification is difficult for most of people due to the high number of recorded species on Earth, due to the growing exchange of plant material between different regions of the world, and due to the growing shortage of taxonomists in many different research institutions. This partially explains why plant blindness is recognized as a major limitation of the involvement of the society in biodiversity conservation activities. But thanks to artificial intelligence and the development of mobile technology, we now have more and more identification tools that are increasingly effective and appreciated by the general public and the experts. In the aim to increase the capacity of citizens to contribute to scientific projects and to better protect world plant biodiversity, we established more than 10 years ago a citizen's observatory of plants that was based on the use of machine learning to help people identify plants. This observatory was initially experimented on southern French Roa and gradually extended to a larger number of regions and countries. Thanks to the improvement of the image-based plant identification techniques experiments and made available, the number of registered participants has been increasing and has made it possible to threaten the recognition capacity of the platform. The general workflow of PlantNet can be divided in three main components. First, the PlantNet hub dedicated to plant identification, which allow both anonymous and authenticated users to take a picture of a plant and to send it to a server for recognition at species level. This recognition, which is performed by a convolutional neural network, allows the user to get a list of candidate species, each of them associated with a confidence score. The second component of the plant network flow is the enrichment of the database to improve the observation quality of the data collected. Because of the huge volume of data collected, this enrich enrichment cannot be done slowly by expert botanists. This is why various crowdsourcing mechanisms have been 
put in place, allowing the collaborative curation of the data aggregated. And the third part of the workflow is the exploitation of the database, which is with, is with its diffusion, which make it uh, which is made available for the needs of stakeholders such as researchers or field managers. Up to now, we count more than 32 million of downloads of the application. Uh, 2.8 million of people created a user account and are able to enrich and create the Produce Collaborative database. We can see from this figure that only less than 10% of users create an account. This explains why we are continuing our efforts to encourage anonymous users to create an account and thus contribute more widely to the project. In the current period, we count between 300 and 600,000 daily users. The user community have contributed to translate the HAP interface in 36 languages, and the platform has contributed to aggregate 485 million of plant identification requests on 36,000 plant species around the world. About 12% of users use it for professional activities. They use it in agroecological activities as well as uh, in land management. PlantNet is also involved in, in large number of educational projects around the world. Based on user demand, a set of tools and services following the FAIR principle were implemented to allow the development of eFloras. Over the past 10 years, the platform has been adapted to several different floras and regions according to the needs and involvement of the project partners, as it can be illustrated here for different continents for which the flora, the plant net platform has been adapted. Sorry. So to support the development of customized eFloa, three complementary concepts have been developed. Micro projects, groups and monitoring workspace, workspace that I will now describe in detail. So micro projects allow a full adaptation of all the interface of the PlantNet app to a list of interests for a particular partners. So this includes the taxonomic explorer, the identification interface, as well as the data stream of the last observation shared by the user network in that micro project. This eFlora can be linked to a specific geographical areas, which allows it to be automatically selected according to the user location based on the user GPS. This adaptation increases the accuracy of the identification as the number of potential species for a given identification request is reduced to the checklist of the micro project only. Microproject allows to foster a particular flora to the PlantNet user network as a microproject is visible to all user authenticated ones as well as anonymous ones. Up to now, 12 microprojects has been adapted to European, African and Asian context. They cover from 80 to 2,400 species and have been implemented for greenhouse of botanical gardens for several natural reserve, as well as for checklist of interest for particular NGOs or research institutes. As the PlantNet API for species identification is available for each eFloras covered on the platform, developers of application can select uh, this uh, eFloras when they develop their own apps in order to obtain the most accurate species identification services that we can propose for their context. In the implementation of new micro projects, we require a non-negligible investment on our part to clean up and upload the taxonomic repository on which they are based. We have experimented the use of complementary services facilitating collaborative work without our necessary involvement. This has been done through the group concept, which is illustrated here on the left uh, of this um, um, slide, and which is available since few weeks on the mobile version of PlantNet. Groups allows any user to create a private or public space on the platform and to permit everyone to aggregate a part or 
or observation in the group. A group is observation centered as opposed to a micro project, which is species centered. Over 2050 groups have been already created since the launch, the launch of this feature on the platform. If the group is public, which is the case of 50% of them, any authenticated users can join it and contribute to it. If it's a private one, only validated users by the group moderator can become a member. We don't have a linguistic, thematic, or geographical moderation for the group creation, which are fully open to the interest of the user network. Four levels of participation are allowed, group creator, group administrator, group members, and group consultants. When a group is restricted to a specific geographical zone, as illustrated here for the floor of the Sala of Oyuni in Bolivia, only observation found in that area are displayed in the group, contrary to the micro project which aggregate all observation produced at the species level. As all the group observation can be downloaded in a CSV format by any group members, group feature can be used to conduct statistical analysis on the aggregated data in order to study plant plots, plant phenology, or user profile. Monitoring workspace allow a given partner to access to all observation and identification requests for a given species list of a particular area. Micro projects and groups only allow exploration of public plant observation explicitly shared by the authenticated users, which represents 12 million of observation, which are only 3% of the total number of identification requests submitted to PlantNet. So this is why we have implemented this new feature in order to allow the access to all the identification requests aggregated since the beginning of the platform. And in order to uh, continue and progress in the development of services that we offer, we have this next step for development. So the development of the offline mobile identification service and uh, exploration service, which will allow to know the most probable species around the observer. The use of a larger uh, number of herbarium specimens to improve a species identification, as well as the TADWIG standard, which allows to know the world geographical schema for the recording of plant distribution and also increase the number of links with descriptive encyclopedia, such as World Flora Online. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jean. I hope that I, I am on time and not too late. Can we have a question from Paco? <laughs> How is PlantNet supported and who, yeah. who pays for it? Yeah, so we have several sources of revenue. So one of them is uh, the consortium of uh, funding members who contribute to, the, to support financially the, 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 the platform with a, an annual contribution. The consortium is open to any new organization who would like to join it and uh, support in order to take larger benefits of the, of the platform. The second source of revenue is the contribution of the end users. We open a, a call for donation every year and they contribute through that aspect. The third one is the deployment services. So micro projects, for example, uh, are in some case contractualized with some partners who want, who want to have an adaptation of the platform to their needs. And the, the fourth one is a response to uh, a research and educational project. Mm. Can you elaborate on how you annotate and manage plant association? So co-occurrence plants, best symbiote pollinators. So at present time, we only record 
plant species and not plant disease or plant pollinators on the platform. So it's only occurrence of plant species that are managed and that are used in some case by uh, partners in order to infer uh, pollinator species that will be occur according to the species communities that can be recorded. So this is the case in one of the HAP that have been developed by the Center of Ecology and Hydrology in UK, which is entitled e -Survivor. And we have also some other partners who take benefits of this plant occurrence data set in order to infer information on uh, 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 plant, uh, plant pollinators. But we don't manage at present time pests or pathogens on the platform. Um, thank you, Pierre. I, th I think we need, we need to move forward and give the floor to our next speaker. Thank Silver you very Sotero. Thank you. And we will have more time at the end of the session. Thank you. So, Sibel, you have the floor. Hi, uh, I thought my talk would be, uh, with, uh, the pre-recorded talk would be shown. Yes. Yes, we are pulling that up now for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sibeli and today I'll be presenting Genomes on a Tree or GOAT database uh, that has been developed in the Sanger Institute within the Tree of Life program. So the Earth Biogenome Project is a global initiative to sequence all eukaryotic life on Earth. It serves as an umbrella for a large number of sequencing projects distributed across the globe and we will generate genome assemblies at a scale never witnessed before. One of the main challenges focused by this network is coordination of efforts, especially without a centralized source of information on two broad categories of data. First, um, although we have a lot of information on sequencing projects that have been completed, uh, information on status and list of sequencing projects that are still in the planning or in the progress stages is not easily uh, findable. Uh, and second, um, also for genome relevant metadata, such as chromosome number, ploidy, genome size estimates for the species targeted for sequencing, which are usually scattered in the literature, but would benefit from being collated into a single location to help guiding uh, the planning and validation for these projects. To address these issues, the Tree of Life program developed Genomes on a Tree, or GOAT, which is a taxon-focused searchable database for metadata that was prepared to support uh, the scale of these global initiatives. GOAT's main purpose is to store and present data to optimize the use of biological resources and promote a better synergy between sequencing projects globally. Three main features makes GOAT a uh, very powerful resources, resources a database. Uh, first, it stores genome-relevant metadata uh, that can be searched. Uh, second, the information is stored in a phylogenetic cont context. And based on the stored information, it can handle missing values and create estimates in a biologically uh, meaningful way. There are many forms that queries are made on GOAT. The most straightforward is to search for attributes of a given taxon using taxon names, such as here for the red fox, for these groupies. The results shown here uh, is an example of a subset of values for the list of over 40 attributes stored on GOAT for the species. So here I give example of ID, uh, assembly, chromosome, and genome size uh, related attributes. But keep in mind that virtually any metadata, such as legislation, threatened status, organelle assembly, summary statistics, can all be stored and displayed in gold. An important aspect of the database is that gold stores the metadata information in a phylogenetic context. So there are values and estimates for all attributes at all taxonomic ranks. For example, we can search uh, on GOAT assembly span values for species in the family candidate that will be displayed here for species, but GOAT will also estimate values for gender, gender, and also for the family. And if you notice to the right side, uh, the values for the selected attributes are displayed beside a color tag, a bar, 
that informs if the value is a direct measurement of the taxon displayed in green or an estimate based on phylogenetically guided interpolation of values, either in red or orange, also uh, filled or not filled bars. And this is how GOAT works. So based on direct measurements in green, the values of attributes are filled up and down the tree. And for example, a value measured for a species can be estimated for the genus, but then used again to estimate the value, missing value for a species that won't have the value for the attributes. And uh, these values are estimated using metrics that are appropriate for that attribute. Uh, for many projects, for instance, estimating genome size of target species is crucial to plan the use of laboratory resources. So that will prevent uh, under sequencing or uh, over sequencing of samples. The metadata stored in GOAT can be useful not only in estimation, but also valid in validation of chromosomal level assemblies. So in the case of species where chromosomal data is already available, such as in the spore species here of oxys, uh, those values can be directly checked just to confirm the chromosomal level assembly. But for the species where no caretypic values are available, uh, range and estimates of these values can help curator make informed decisions to deliver a final chromosomal level assembly. It is important to emphasize that the attributes uh, in both can be queried individually, but also in combination. Uh, that thresholds can be defined in the search for these attributes, and uh, in that way, uh, the results can be visualized both on the tree themselves, but also um, in, in plots and reports, such as the one displayed here to the left side, that is showing pretty much the available assemblies meeting the metrics defined by the Earth Biogenome Project based on the Contig N50 and scaffold N50 for the assemblies. Um, one thing that I have to mention is that these complex query result, uh, queries result from the design of code architecture and the, how the data is treated to maximize efficiency in the retrieval of information. Uh, I'm not getting into detail on the implementation of code architecture today because of time, but if you have interest in the topics, the publication and documentation are on the way, but meanwhile, you can always contact us at uh, at genomehubs.org. But pretty much uh, as a summary, GOAT has been structured into three uh, main components. Uh, backend has both command line and uh, public API interface that can be used to retrieve GOAT data directly. Uh, whereas the web uh, user interface uh, is where queries can be made using the search boxes and the uh, options uh, by the, the user and also to create reports. Uh, just to summarize, GOAT uses uh, retrieve data and use pairs of uh, the tabular format of the data plus a corresponding YAML file to generate uh, there is input into Elasticsearch. So, um, yeah, Go uses an Elasticsearch index as the primary data store, which allows efficient searches across all data in GOAT. Well, uh, GOAT was also designed to collate updates on target species and priority lists alongside sequencing status so that different projects can plan and inform their sequencing strategies accordingly. So it is possible to create lists such as this one and download them per project, such as here for the Darwin Tree of Life that shows not only the, the, the target species, but also those that have a priority for the project right now. Visualization of overlap between projects is also possible. So in this case, for instance, uh, we found three species that are in the long list, so targeted by the Catalan Biogenome Project, but they are also family representatives within the Darwin Tree of Life program, for instance. Uh, and queries like this will be very important to inform big consortia, but also the smaller labs and local projects globally. And this type of search ensures that there is synergy between projects across the globe. 
finally, we are adding to GOAT uh, the project summary pages, uh, which each project can display information and customize graphs and reports as they choose. So there are many options of customizable uh, plots from simple species counts and pie charts as displayed here, uh, the number of uh, chromosomal level assemblies that Darwin Tree of Life has contributed among all chromosomal level assemblies uh, available in CBI. Uh, also rainbow plots showing progress in the number of available genomes per taxonomic rank. So for species, genus, family, and so on overall and per project to even more complex plots showing correlations and uh, also frequency distributions over time as shown here for the earth biogenome projects such as the assembly contiguity stats but also the progress of sequencing of eukaryotic species by the project over time uh, this is who we are uh, GOAT was designed uh, by Envision by Professor Mark Blackster at the Sanger Institute and has been developed by Rich and Sujay. Uh, and I am their uh, genomic data curator and helping out um, and curating some of the data stuff. The current status of GOAT is that we have a lot of taxa already there. I forgot to mention, but we use both, we can choose which backbone taxonomy to use. Right now we are including only uh, NCBI uh, taxonomy, but also open tree of life, uh, but more will be included in the future. Uh, the backend is pretty much fully functional uh, and we are now working on how to make the user interface a bit more user friendly. Uh, Go is searchable already now it can be used right now it has weekly updates but we are still populating the database with priority lists the sequencing statuses uh, and we are always looking for new data sources so if you have uh, interest or if you think of anything that would benefit from being gold don't hesitate and contact us and help us feed the goat and with that i'll take any questions if you have them thank you So let's see if um, we can add questions. I don't see anything in the chat right now. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, there is one question uh, from the Google chat, chat uh, that um, they're asking where I draw the draw the taxonomic classification from and if it's built on the fly. So I guess I mentioned it, but only uh, later, that uh, right now we have the NCBI taxonomy as the backbone, the main backbone, but we also have included uh, the one from OTT, uh, Open Tree of Life taxonomy, just to test if we can swap, if user can swap and choose their favorite uh, classification, right, the, the taxonomy. And the tests uh, were successful, but it's not available in outside the test server yet. But in theory, we can use any uh, backbone taxonomy, and this is going to be the goal of uh, implementing into the, the portal. Well, if uh, there is no more questions now, yes, remember that at the end of the session, we will have a new opportunity for questions. So with this, th thank you, Sibel. With this, we uh, give the floor to the, our following speaker, Adeline Kerner. The floor is yours. Hi everyone, today I'm gonna um, do an overview around XB3. I'm not sure, it's, yeah, no, 
Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, so um, Expert Free is a web platform that manages the descriptive uh, data and provides interactive uh, keys with a free access. It's free, and before we've got Expert and Expert 2. It's used for various taxonomic groups, and sometimes it's used for more original things such as Pokemon or rocks. Since the platform is online, we've got more and more users and more and more uh, knowledge base. Uh, so we have to pay attention to maintain the platform and to, to the evolution of it. And one thing that is important is to become more and more fair with our data. When you've got more and more user question arrive and more and more people ask us to have the list of what already existed. So we listen to them and try something. So first of all, we decide to reference only when the user that created a database uh, is okay to share his metadata. For the moment, we've got uh, in the properties um, few questions to know if people want to share something or not. And on the server test, the test server, we've got more precise questions such as, do you want to share the link to your key? Um, metadata, user is free to complete what you want. We can select the geography, the spotography, the taxonomy, or nothing. Why not? And if it's okay, it will appear in the Explorer website. For the moment online, we've got only the purple uh, parts. And soon we will have the other ones. And yes, for the moment, it's only in French. <laughs> but the team works hard to have the English version. So you can search. For example, there we search everything about Parifera. There's only one possibility and uh, you can click and have a sheet with a different information on it and the link to the website. You can navigate soon with different uh, possibility. You can use a map, the taxonomy, just uh, have a look to everything, or you have different statistics. It's quite uh, interesting, but we need people are okay to share their works. Okay, um, now there are different platform and software to create a free access key. But in Expert Free, we've got a specificity called Calculate Descriptors. I have already talked about that a lot of time during previous TED week, but quickly for new people, um, you can create automatically new descriptors uh, from descriptors that are already in your database. With an example, it will be easier to understand. <laughs> so for example, there you have different characters that already exist and you want to add something to have a more complete uh, knowledge base. And uh, I wanna say, okay, can you find everywhere where you've got bumps with only one per perforation in the central part? and name it pustulae. And everywhere you've got this free condition, you've got pustulae uh, um, filling. Okay, so another thing is the inter interoperability. Um, now, Expert3 and Annotate and Collection Database are more and more uh, connected. Um, I don't 
talk a lot with annotate it's just a software free um, you can describe your virtual specimen very easily and if you want to know more <laughs> come to the poster session um, but the idea is you can use the descriptor from expert free import them into annotate and so you've got the list of a controlled vocabulary you can use to describe everything and then you describe all your specimen you can import in EDD format one more time in expert free your description and your knowledge base become more and more complete so it's very interesting um, yeah now you've got a complete database you're okay but you're a researcher so you need to be able to analyze the data and we are working on some expert tools for, for the moment it's only on the server test um at the end we hope we will have all this and maybe more and more thing um, we focus on the first part uh, for the moment with uh, similarities uh, between items or between descriptors you will have something like this you choose what kind of distance and what you want to compare it will um, create a csv format and then, <laughs> nope, <laughs> yep. Uh, and then you've got uh, your chief and just analyze uh, your result as you want. So at the beginning, I said, we try to become more and more fair <laughs> um, for taxa, we've got a unique ID generated by Expert Free uh, automatically, but you can change it and use the ID you want from where you want. We hope soon <laughs> it's not just uh, writing the ID, but interaction between information from uh, where you take your ID. But for the moment, we only have an ID and we've got exactly the same thing. Nope. Yep, for the descriptors and for the states. So generate automatically, but you can change as you want. The problem for the descriptor is in expert free, we've got only one ID for the entity and the quality. And if you wanna share with ontology for example we need to separate and have an id for the entity and one different for the quality so we know we have to work out out about that so uh everything is at the beginning but we the team work out to improve more and more the free uh, yes no why i don't know okay so thank you for your intention and if you have any question or comments i am here and i can answer William? So there's a lot of questions. Uh, yeah. Sorry that. <laughs> okay, so in, yes, uh, VSDD format is interoperating with other system 
such as the seed and delta. Sometimes there are some problems, but if you contact us, we can just modify a little the SDD and it will be okay. Um, uh, are there specimens that can be annotated coming from Paris herbarium or can I link up with images from other herbaria too? Yeah, you can use uh, it, of course, because annotate, uh, recall not, uh, at the beginning it was for, for the plants, for the herbarium, and uh, yeah, from Paris. In fact, you can import um, specimen from uh, everywhere in France into annotate, or you can use your own picture. It works. Uh, you can. Yeah, you can choose what you want to study. Uh, it's okay, and it works quite well. I don't know if you answered this one. Um, do you use controlled vocabularies or ontologies for morphological characters? And what are your recommended controlled vocabularies ontologies? Okay, so uh, for the moment, the user use exactly what you want. I know some sorry for the train. Um, I know some baths as a link to ontology. For example, there are all, all, at least one uh, database about plants using the plant ontology. And the links is in details because when it had been created, uh, we haven't the ID. But for the moment, users do exactly what you want. And we hope one day we can say, hey, maybe you can use something, but for the moment, user is free to do what you want to do. Um, and export to Delta. Um, what about the SDD standard? Yeah, you can, can yeah, you can export with the SDD format and it should be okay to import in Delta after. Um, normally, we try to follow the evolution of the ZD format, so it should work. Anything else, William? I don't see anything else here in the chat. Okay. Um, Adeline, we had a question in Whova. Is the XPER available as open source software for reuse? Um, hmm. Good question. I'm not sure about that. Uh, maybe origin is there and should answer. It will be better. I don't want to say something wrong. Uh, Sounds like to be determined, so that's okay. And then we had one, I see that on your site, users are required to set up a login. If a developer of an ID key does that and uses your infrastructure to create a key, are the users of that key also required to set up a login? No, um, you, need a, <laughs> you need an account to, to be able to create, it seems logical, but um, when you create a database, you can uh, ask to publish your a key and just give the links to everyone, everyone, everybody. So the user can just click on the URL and you can use it without an account. So it's only if you want to create an account. Uh, yes, for the moment, uh, it's found by your, by your institution, so it's okay. Uh, and when the cold, <laughs> um, I don't know uh, when, the, when the code will be publicly available. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, may, maybe Regine uh, may have more idea about that. Okay, thank you, Adeline. So uh, with this, we will pass on to our next speaker, Honkui. You have the, the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, I will share my pre-recorded um, presentation. Uh, good morning, I'm Hong Tui. On behalf of the Authors Project, I would like to thank the TEDLAC organizers for the opportunity to present our prototyping work to support author-driven computable phenotype data and ontology production. TEDWAC community knows that phenotype information in current publications is in, in general not, visible, not easily findable, accessible, interoperable, or reusable. Current practice of making use of published phenotype information includes professional curation, but this practice is known to be expensive and is burdened with inter-curator variation. That is, the same piece of information curated by different curators could produce different results. Such intercurator variation is mainly caused by the ambiguity in the published phenotype descriptions, which remains an issue for the automated information extraction approach. The third approach, author curation, where authors are invited to curate their own published work, has low response rate, and the authors often face issues such as the terms they need are not in the ontology, and adding a new term to the ontology can take a long time. What we proposed in the authors in the um, driver's seat project is to enable authors to produce fair data at the time of, of the publication, allowing them to be, produce human readable descriptions and RDF data at the same time. We would allow authors to add terms to ontologies when they need them, and allow best term and practices to emerge from community practices. In this talk, I will present the main outcome of the author's project. I would briefly report the findings from a 2019 survey on biologist attitude towards ontologies, curation, and potential solutions. I will illustrate how our software prototype support authors to create semantic representations for numerical characters and for colors. I will highlight semantic checking features in our software prototypes, character recorder, and conflict resolver. The attitude survey received 91 effective responses. The survey can still be accessed at the link provided here. The 28 questions included in the survey asked about respondents' current experience and overall attitude with control vocabularies or ontologies their awareness of the issues around ambiguous information and post-publication curation. We also asked about their preferred solutions, the effort they are willing to commit, and their desired rewards for adopting a new authoring workflow. We found that 73% of the respondents is frustrated with ambiguity in published phenotypic descriptions. We found that although many control vocabularies are available, and are known to the respondents, the use of the control vocabularies is not common in publications or in daily work. We saw a strong agreement that author curation, as opposed to professional curation, would reflect the original meaning of the phenotype information better. What is really encouraging is that 85% of the respondents would try a new authoring workflow if the resultant data is more consistent and less ambiguous. In addition, if a new authoring workflow only requires 5% more effort to use, then 93% of the respondents would try it and possibly adopt it. And higher effort any higher effort requirement would result in a steep decline in the likely adoption rate. At the same time, 22% of the participants admitted that they would not use a control vocabulary if not mandatory. Other interesting findings can be found in our paper to appear in Oxford's database journal. Keep the findings from the survey in mind, we designed our new authoring workflow prototype to be intuitive and friendly to use. 
The software integrates ways to support authors to semantically define their characters or select characters that are well defined by others. Here, I will present two examples. Since we used plant genus Carex as our case study, the examples you will see are related to Carex but generally applicable to other taxa. The first example is a semantic representation of numerical characters. Those are measurements such as length, width, and distance. In publications, we could find a statement that says peridinium beak 1.6 millimeters, but without description on how the length was measured, this statement carries no useful information for computation because there are several different ways the length could have been measured. Character Recorder enables users to create a new numerical character by defining how the measurement is taken. They would specify the landmarks where the measurement starts and ends, structures that should be included or excluded, and where a measurement is taken. The software would check those landmark terms, and if they're not in the backend ontology, it would ask the user to provide more information, for example, provide a definition for a term. If a term is already in the ontology, a green check mark would indicate that. Characters created by the users are saved in the ontology and immediately available for others to use and, and view. Character Recorder also holds illustrations of the numerical characters frequently used by Carex experts. Our usability experiment showed that the participants find the illustrations very useful. The second example of semantic representation is pertinent to colors. Professor Starr of University of Ottawa and a student provides us a valuable data set of color measurements for 300 carex species. Colors of leaf, peridinium, etc. of real specimen were captured using ImageJ. Corresponding color phrases were collected from Flora North America. It is well known that the color labels are not good semantic representation for colors. Here we see that same color being labeled differently as light green and bright green. The same label pale green is used for dramatically different colors. Using this data set, we wanted to derive a color palette using a data mining approach. We used various clustering and classification methods on the color RGB values and found RGB color space is not a very suitable representation for colors. Machine-produced groupings do not correspond to human perception very well. Showing in the left graph, in the red-green space, different colors are mixed together. When we map the colors from the RGB color space to the LAB color space, the colors were much better separated, as you can see in the right graph. But neither color space were good for separating colors when human color labels are used. Different color labels are mixed in the color spaces. We used a support vector machine to group different colors based on their A and B values. Then used lightness axis to divide colors into light, medium, and dark groups to create color palettes like what is shown in the slide. These color palettes are now used in the character recorder. A segment of the character matrix in character recorder is shown at the bottom of this slide. I included a set of slides that show the semantic feature of character recorder, but I don't have time to go through them in detail. We would appreciate it if the audience would review them in the PPT file and play with character recorder live at the link provided here. This screenshot shows the setup matrix page. User can create a new character. They need to define the character. After the user select or created characters needed for their matrix, they will input values. The matrix is transformed into RDF trick files nightly, and the user can also generate a narrative description based on the matrix. The matrix, the description, and the trick files are all exportable. A input template is provided for users to create or reuse values. Input template shows the user terms that are in the ontology for them to select. Input template checks the ontology and suggests better terms for the user. In case terms in an existing matrix becomes deprecated in the ontology, the user will be signified and they can take actions to update their matrix 
or dispute the deprecation. Terms, including characters added by the users in character recorder can create issues. For example, one term may be added to different superclasses. Terms are added with poor definitions. Multiple synonyms are added as independent classes. Such conflicts are collected from character recorder regularly and presented in the mobile app for domain experts to resolve. As research prototypes, the, all these softwares are experimental instruments we use to investigate how to best support authors to produce fair data. Components of character recorder and conflict resolver have gone through several usability studies, which answered a set of questions. We now know that undergraduate students can define numerical char characters in less than five minutes. The character sharing and reuse features in character recorder reduce character variation by 48%. We used a combination of simple forms and wizards to enable users to add terms to ontology. We are currently recruiting taxonomists to participate in a three-day experiment with character recorder and conflict resolver. A honorarium of $200 per day is offered for participants. Um, if you're interested in participating in the experiment, please contact me directly. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. We have a, a couple of requests to add the links that were provided in the presentation to the to the chat, if possible. All right, I'm happy to do that. And also for the for the uh, the tool the tool in the questionnaire. Any questions? Let's see. The mobile app is not currently public um, accessible, but the source code is all on GitHub. I can also paste to the GitHub link to, in the chat. Everything here is open source. Well, as we are in the in the latest se uh, section of our session, I think we can also open the microphones and ask questions directly to the, to the presenters. So, if if anyone wants to to ask something in voice, feel, feel free. Um, there was a question. Do you have a link to the questionnaire results? Uh, the, we can certainly share that, but um, we are currently in the minor revision for the manuscript submitted to database, and we plan to actually put everything, the source data and our analysis process in a Jupyter notebook, so everybody can access that. In the published journal, we will provide a link. Um, in the published article, we will provide a link to that. And interest in that can certainly um, come get in touch with me. I'll, I'll be happy to send the source data now. Um, I have a question for you, Hongkui. Um, the, the system that, that you are presenting us um, now is basically something for the work to, to do ahead. It's, it's not useful for recovering past information, isn't it, that way? Right, yes. We have done quite a bit information extraction work in the past on the um, legacy data set. Um, that, that work leads to our investig investigation in terms of how to get users not to produce legacy data. So this piece of work presented here is for the future. We want people to stop producing, spending time and not producing useful data.
So I, I want to highly encourage people to join our um, usability studies. Um, I want to say if I have a minute, the goal of usability study is really to test out if user adding very complex term, can our system handle that? I think your contribution at this point is going to be critical for us to build a, a brighter future for to get the authors to produce higher data. So we'll have to send, go They're ahead, looking go. for CAREX specialists. Any taxonomist who knows about CAREX are excellent candidates. I might provide you with some. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, if I can comment, um, well, it was actually a very, very interesting talk to me. And I'm uh, working now with ontology. So I'm trying to develop uh, together with uh, other colleagues, uh, Kilopoda Anatomy Ontology. And part of the work is, um, facilitated because we already have a standardized terminology for Kilopoda, published and in use for 10 years. So maybe that can be useful for your project. But in general, something that I said at the last uh, TAD week, so in 2020, and that I would like to repeat now is that if we want to get uh, taxonomists closer to using these tools, we need to integrate these tools into publication workflows. And that is, for example, I say it then and I say it again, we need to work with the people from the open journal systems to develop this software further to publish biological data in a structured format and then have a database on characters, on character states, on terms and so that the people could import into an open journal system writing tool and reuse these for free. Yeah, That's so this is, this is the most widely used platform. So if we could work together in that direction, so now, now um, uh, we're trying to work on a project proposal for a surface of the BioFeed uh, project in Senckenberg, Frankfurt. And your work is super interesting for that. So if, if we could collaborate in the future, like right now after Tadwick, that would be great for us. So we are in the same line of thinking. I'm highly interested. We actually have Pensoft on board also um, in this theme. So we should work together, get to the authors. I definitely agree with you. It has to be linked to the publication platform. Hmm. Yeah, one, one of the problems that I addressed the other time was also about Pensoft. So it is good that we have the private sector providing this granularity data service but we need that same service for a tool that everyone can use because using the pens of writing tool is expensive and hiring this service and having a software migrated to the uh, Alpha platform is not accessible to everyone across the world while the open journal system is. So we have to put more effort into developing a writing tool for the open journal systems, which everyone okay. can use. Mm -hmm. Certainly, points were taken. Well, while, while you're thinking about what to ask or your questions, I have one for Sibel. Uh, from your presentation, it was for me hard, hard to, to grasp how, how you work. Uh, for instance, you harvest data from the projects into your server and then you index the data. How do you do that? Or do you, you, do you partner with other projects? Um, how does it work? Okay, uh, yeah, I guess I should have been more clear into that. The, the, the way Go was designed, actually Geno, Genome Hubs as a, as a whole, and then Gold is an instance of Genome Hubs is that virtually any kind of metadata can be presented as long as we have a source of uh, a tabular uh, file format. And uh, okay, so for, for the project right now, what we do, we have anything that is an available database for genome relevant metadata. So the chromosome counts of animals, uh, for plants, 
uh, genome size databases. We are retrieving information from all those sources that are publicly available, but also we are contacting the experts or getting information also from publications. So the, the, the idea is to turn all this into an automated system that we go updates weekly and it will retrieve from these pages or from APIs when possible live. But for the, also for the, so this is the metadata for gen genomes side of it. But then for the project, uh, we are arranging now with the Earth Biogenome project as a whole. There are 49 uh, partners so far that they would provide us directly their lists. But it's kind of tricky because uh, some of them already have uh, websites with that information. So we are arranging with them so we can just grab from their API directly into gold. But some of them don't, don't have that. So they have all sorts of formatted lists that we are trying to uh, find a, a midpoint there where we can retrieve that information uh, from a Google sheet, for instance. And uh, as they update, go, goes there and updates every week. We also want to do that every uh, day instead of every week, and we are moving towards that. So I, I'm not sure I answer completely your question, but the idea right. is to, to get from everything that is available as long as people want to show them. But I'm, I'm, okay. setting the limits is uh, now the, the, the main challenge. But, but then you will have to, to look up the question such as possibility and giving credit to the sources. Yes, and this, all that. this yeah, this has been done. So as long as the 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 data use, uh, how do I say, the, the the policy of usage and, and redistribution of the data is uh, fair, we can use. For those that don't, we are asking for permissions as appropriate. And then, uh, yeah, so some people are reluctant to share, but uh, since we are getting information on the completed projects, and then most of the, the people that are doing the, the sequencing, they are making their information public, then we have, uh, we hope that as GOAT grows, uh, more people will be willing to share. But yeah, we cannot just go into a book and retrieve the information. We have to yeah. follow the, the standards because um, GOAT is completely, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, people can use even the, the code, they can replicate GOAT as a small instance in their own labs if they want, so yeah. If you have a question, I do so. Okay, so since we have a few more minutes, um, again for 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 Sibel, how many projects are you pondering with both? How many? You being, sorry. How many projects are you bringing together in both? Yes. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, the Earth Biogenome Project is a network so far with 49 uh, sequencing projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but more are joining over time. So the, the plan is to have everything, everything sequenced within 12 years. So yeah, we hope that more people, more projects will join. And yes, um, are you thinking of using uh, DOIs for the data sets you are aggregating? Sorry? I didn't get if you're question. thinking of using DOIs, those digital object identifiers, just to, to track use and credit. I am not as, really as, sure. As GBF is using, as Disco is thinking of using, as I mean, lots of, of projects are moving into that direction. I, I am not, I, maybe I, I don't know how to answer it yet. Maybe I can go back and uh, ask the people that are developing really to. To see, but I, right now I don't think I have the information to, to be sure about it. So I didn't want to say anything. I don't know. <laughs> and then we had a question from James. Do you see gaps in the met metadata standards to allow potential integration? Um, so I, I don't understand the, 
on, on the metadata standards is that so yeah. so i can uh, i can talk here Sibel. Oh. so i'm talking about the standards that come along with you know these genomes so this is part of the you know provenance evidence you know how do we trust the genomes that were built uh, and what metadata sometimes there's really great metadata that comes with these products that you might not directly care about but others would and so you want to keep those close to the source if, if you're aggregating and so when you get in that space as you know things like mixs well they have hundreds and hundreds of fields of possibilities and and standardization so i just wonder if you've looked at those challenges or if that's something that's sort of off to the side a bit yeah, so this is the, actually um, we've been discussing that, especially with the with the partners of EBP. The thing is that GOAT is collating everything that is out there, including things in the NCBI, ENA. And for some of those, I mean, we, per project, we really wanted to 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 be able to to show and that we are following the standards of the sequencing that is out there and the metadata is as complete as possible. But for instance, there is the option in NCBI when people are depositing uh, um, a sequence that they can link it to the Earth Biogenome Project, uh, Bioproject ID, not necessarily following the standards. So we are discussing a way that we can in gold show what has really been developed by the sub-projects within the network from those that didn't. So it's kind of still in the, the backstage. And uh, yeah, we are also for the taxonomy, it's been crazy. Uh, we're using synonyms, but it's, there's so much that we can do when things are out there. Yeah, so yeah, this, this is talk that is happening uh, on the backstage, but we're still on the planning phase for those for that situation yeah well, I, I hope great. i, I answered answer the question because <laughs> no it that's important and i i just wanted to say that you know at tadwig and and our relationship with the uh, genome standards court consortium etc we've been trying to build bridges between the you know molecular side linking into the biology side to make your life easier. Uh, and we've just been recently doing that work and there's more work happening now. So it would be interesting to uh, collaborate a bit and just make those connections uh, to Yes, whole definitely. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that was the point of uh, Darwin Three of Life sending me to this conference. That's my first time here. And uh, I'm new in the job. And I guess uh, my, my, my goal here was to see what's out there, what I, how can we uh, find ways that we can do this properly. So, yes. Yeah, great. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>uh creative common uh, license and so on and so on and so we have a particular process to filter the data based on many different criteria based on geolocation uh, precision uh, identification accuracy uh, image quality uh, and as you can see we filter drastically uh, the, the the data that we share on jbif and that we share on the platform itself. Uh, so we do that because we want to uh, only, only push what seems to be the most fruitful for scientific community and uh, um, uh, land managers. But we are sure that there is a, a quite huge number of interesting data in that uh, huge data set. But we, we think that it's probably the best thing is probably to keep it uh, 
safe and do not open too quickly because uh, it should be a shame to have a uh, too much critics and uh, yeah. perturbation in the development of the platform according to the fact that we know that there is a lot of noise in that data set so we work on a automated process to to to, to extract the most fruitful part of that uh, useful data set thank you so we have time for one last question from the audience. And if not, just to thank you all for your participation in this session and special thanks to our presenters for sharing the knowledge with us this time. Thank you. Goodbye. Keep enjoying thank the you. conference. Thank you, Paco. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks everybody. We are going to be on a quick break. Uh, we will return in about an hour and 15 minutes. You guys can use this time as a uh, open discussion. We just have it marked as a social hour, but you guys are all welcome to um, speak freely, unmute yourselves, hang out. Um, and please remember to use the community board feature in Whova. There are a couple of topics and icebreakers going on in there. And just unmute yourself and holler for us if you have any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Avery. Absolutely, no problem. So I'll just here for a few minutes before I take a break. Anybody have any questions or comments, thoughts? Um, for the 65 people. Carlos, thank you 